Hello, and welcome to the most recent installment of the National D-Day Memorial's Lunchbox Lecture Series. My name is Mitchell Gaiman. I am the Education and Public Outreach Coordinator here at the Memorial, and I also happen to be the presenter for today's Lunchbox Lecture. So if you're expecting someone super special, super important, unfortunately, you're stuck with me. So if you choose to stay and listen to me during uh, the course of this lecture, our topic today is going to be the experience and handling of refugees and displaced persons during and after World War II. Uh, it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart as I've spent quite some time in both university and on my own in my own free time studying this topic. But some of you might be wondering, uh, why would you talk about this topic? It's not nearly as exciting as planes and submarines and uh, battleships and battles. And, you know, does it really have anything to do with World War II? Uh, so let's go over uh, to our slides. And over again, there we go. So this is uh, some of the reasons why I think it's important to talk about this topic of refugees during World War II. The first reason is World War II was a major crisis, uh, but it was a crisis in two ways, because obviously I think most of us can guess that it was a crisis. Um, the first and most obvious crisis was it was a cataclysmic war, the likes of which the world has not seen since. Uh, it cost thousands of lives and ultimately changed the course of history. The second crisis that World War II was that I think a lot of us forget sometimes is a massive humanitarian crisis. Obviously, most of us are familiar with the Holocaust and the millions of lives that uh, that perpetrated by, or that action perpetrated by the Nazis cost. But there were also just millions of people displaced from their homes in the face of the advance of Nazi armies. And so a lot of times in our minds, we keep these two things separate, uh, the humanitarian side of World War II and the war side of World War II. But the reality is both were happening at the same time and both are sides of the same coin of World War II. The second reason why we should talk about this is refugees are people too, uh, and their history deserves to be investigated. History is the study of human experiences and refugees experience in World War II was a human experience. And so if we don't talk about it, if we avoid it, we are doing a disservice to proper historical research. And the final reason that I think this is an important thing for us to look at is that this problem is still around today. And so we can look at how refugees were handled following World War II, and we can look at what mistakes were made then uh, that maybe we're still making now, and what were they doing then that maybe we don't do now that maybe we could learn from and maybe improve how we in this world today handle refugees. So before I go on, most of the talk is going to be focused on World War II uh, and the post-war period refugees, how they were handled then, but I think it's important for you guys to get a little bit of uh, understanding of what the refugee system looked like before World War II. So in the late 1800s and early 1900s, refugees were cared for mostly by charitable voluntary organizations. Uh, think of the International Red Cross. I don't think most of us need uh, any sort of information about them. They still exist today. They provide medical care as well as physical care for refugees and other just groups that need assistance. Uh, but there were also plenty of voluntary organizations that focused on specific ethnic groups. So an example of one of those is the American Joint Distribution Committee. Uh, they were, as you can probably tell, focused on uh, Jewish people groups and providing aid to them. Before the 1900s, in the late 1800s, they were mostly providing aid to Russian Jews that were being pushed out of Russia due to uh, pogroms. Following World War I, uh, which was a conflict that ravaged Europe and saw the rise and fall of nations and millions of refugees uh, flooding Europe and other parts of the world, uh, they were fleeing war and the fallout of the war, uh, like the Russian Civil War, the Armenian Genocide, uh, famine, and an influx of POWs. Um, these voluntary organizations that existed before World War I recognized that they were not really up to the task of taking care of refugees uh, by themselves. 
they were either too focused on specific groups or their fingers were in so many pies that it was hard for them to get their act together. And so uh, I have up here uh, on my screen, I have a couple uh, images that show these different things that were coming out of World War I. Uh, we have POWs in a POW camp. A lot of these guys were just left over. Uh, sometimes their countries didn't even exist anymore. And so they didn't know where they were supposed to return to. And so they were just left in the countries that they had been captured by. You have massive amounts of famine that broke out after the war. Uh, and then finally, I have a picture of uh, the Russian Civil War, where the people that lost uh, the Civil War, the uh, monarchist Russians, uh, fled Russia and were now all over Europe or as far afield as Egypt. Uh, and so the League of Nations was approached by these different organizations, these different voluntary organizations, uh, and asked to look into it. Um, and the League of Nations decided that they should probably help out with this issue. And so they created something called the High Commissioner for Russian Refugees. Uh, this was led initially by a man named Dr. Fritjof Nansen. He was an Arctic explorer and uh, he eventually became a Nobel Peace Laureate winner. He became a uh, scientist. He was sort of a jack of all trades, but a master of everything, not just a master of none. Um, and it began as an organization that would just help with Russian refugees. They would coordinate sending these Russian refugees to places where they could finally settle down. They would ensure that they would be protected by the nations that they were staying in. They would also help provide uh, organization for voluntary organizations to get this, uh, get material aid where it needed to be and make sure that things weren't being wasted. Uh, and eventually, I have here on the slide that it was the High Commissioner for Refu Russian Refugees, and then some more, and then some more, and then some more. Uh, this does eventually increase in who it's supposed to be in charge of. So it starts out as Russian refugees, then it becomes Russian and Armenian refugees, then um, Persian refugees, and more and more and more as the League starts to find its footing. Um, Dr. Nansen also creates something called the Nansen Passport. The Nansen passport is exactly what it sounds like. It is a passport for these refugees. A lot of these refugees, when they fled the nations that they had originally come from, no longer had a sort of identification document that they could use. Um, they had left it at home. Or alternatively, mostly in the case of those that had fled Russia, they had been denationalized. So the new Soviet government in Russia said that anybody who was taking part of the war and has now fled, if they do not choose to return, we are going to be removing their nationality from them. So they are no longer Russian, they are now stateless. And so these people did not have a valid passport. Dr. Nansen created an internationally recognized passport for them so that they could travel, so that they had a form of ID. And it was a really, really big deal. Uh, things were going so well that the League of Nations uh, turned this high commissioner office into something called the Nansen Commission basically just a slightly bigger office than what had uh, existed previously. And it was named after Nansen because he was so good at his job. So that all sounds, I mean, pretty good to me anyway. They're taking care of re refugees. Uh, they have this thing set up. They're protected. They have identification documents. That, that sounds pretty good. And the League of Nations agreed. Uh, they figured all good things and, and bad things have to come to an end. And so eventually, this uh, this refugee crisis that grew up in the 1920s, it's got to come to an end at some point. And so they planned for the Nancy Commission to dissolve or finish its operations in 1938, because they figured by then most of these refugees will have been resettled. There probably won't be any more. Uh, we are able to take our gloves off at this point. Problem solved. However, as most of us know, uh, especially those of us who are interested in history around this time period, uh, that wasn't the case. The 1930s was not this time period where there were less refugees that were coming up. It was a time period where more were starting to fill Europe because of the rise of the Nazi party. Um, this started a new wave, I have it misspelled, it says wage, uh, but new wave of refugee movements in Europe. Uh, this began in March of 1933 with something called the Law for the Restoration of Professional Civil Service. This was one of the first Nazi laws that instituted Nazi-style anti-Semitism into uh, German law. Uh, 
and it made it so that certain people could no longer no longer hold jobs and they were removed from their positions. And so this made a bunch of people who had who were Jewish and had previously held jobs, now that they lost them, they started to go to other countries around Germany in the hopes of finding a new job. There were also people who were politically opposed to the Nazis that fled Germany because they knew they would probably uh, suffer underneath the new Nazi regime. So the League of Nations recognizes this and they create something called the High Commissioner for Refugees, Jewish and other from Germany in 1933. And this is an organization that is very, very similar to the Nansen Commission. It does a lot of the same things. It is just specifically geared towards Jewish and other German uh, refugees from Germany as they're fleeing to other parts of Europe. It was headed by a man named uh, James G. McDonald. He's the picture up at the top there. He's an American. A lot of people don't realize that Americans took part in uh, League of Nations organizations, but they did. Uh, and the High Commission for German Refugees was also slated, like the Nansen Commission, to dissolve after 1938 because the League of Nations assumed surely this issue of Jewish refugees will not continue on into the 1940s. It probably is going to be done uh, by 1938. However, as the 1930s progress, as things get worse and worse in Germany, they start to recognize it probably is not a problem that is going to go away. And so they merge the Nansen Commission and the High Commissioner for Refugees from Germany into a single office called the High Commissioner for Refugees in 1939. This combines both of the offices. They look after all the previous refugee groups, as well as these uh, Jewish German refugees. And it's headed by a British man named Sir Herbert Emerson. He's that picture down at the bottom. So as I've been talking about these different League of Nations organizations, you might be wondering what other organizations existed to help refugees both before and then during the war. Because as we may be familiar with, the war started in September of 1939. So that only complicated uh, everybody's ability to take care of refugees because all of a sudden now, is there, now there's this massive war. So let's talk about some of the other organizations that were existing to help refugees. The first that we're gonna talk about is the Intergovernmental Committee for Refugees or the IGCR. It's most similar to the Nansen Commission. It has a lot of the same responsibilities. It was created at the Evian Conference of 1938 at the insistence of American Secretary of State Cordell Hull and American President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Its job was to coordinate voluntary efforts to make sure everything was being streamlined uh, to help out people, uh, to help out refugees specifically. It was supposed to organize uh, the immigration process. So the IGCR was made up of what were called nations of temporary uh, refuge and nations of final refuge. Nations of temporary refuge were basically all the countries that were around Germany that was getting that initial influx of refugees and Great Britain. So they were places where refugees would flee initially, but probably wouldn't plan on staying forever. And then nations of temporary refuge were the United States, Latin American countries, countries that were open to more uh, refugee influx. And so the IGCR's job was to organize immigration policies between these countries to make it a little bit easier for refugees to flee there. And then finally, their other job was to negotiate directly with the German government to make it so that the Jews that were fleeing uh, when they left, they would be able to maintain more of their wealth. Should be noted, they weren't negotiating to stop uh, this influx of refugees or negotiating to try and make the Nazis stop uh, essentially kicking the Jews out of Germany, but rather it was to make it so that when these Jews eventually did decide to leave, Jews and others eventually decided to leave, they would be able to keep more of their material wealth because as it stood, they were being forced to flee with basically the clothes on their back. And once they got to the nations they were finding refuge in, they didn't have anything when they got there to support themselves with. Unfortunately for the IGCR, they tended to not be incredibly successful during the war. They weren't very successful until uh, closer to the end of the war. Next, we have the Central Committee for Refugees. 
Central C Committee for Refugees is a United Kingdom centric organization. It's created in the 1940s. Um, it is also led by Sir Herbert Emerson, uh, just like the I just like the IGCR eventually will be, and the League of Nations High Commission is. And basically, it's a really really simple organization. It is a monetary assistance organization. Uh, what they do is they receive the receipts from voluntary organizations for what they have done to help uh, refugees, to help them immigrate, or to just help their physical well-being. They look over the receipts, make sure that everything is in order, and then they pay for 50% of whatever cost this voluntary organization accrued. So basically, it is a way for the British government to support voluntary organizations in their efforts without having to do any of the work themselves. The second one is, or the Third one is the War Refugee Board. War Refugee Board is basically the American version of the Central Committee for Refugees, although at no point was it paying for as much as 50% of costs for voluntary organizations. It was made up of the Secretaries of State, Secretary of Treasury, and Secretary of War, uh, Cordell Hull, Morgenthau, and um, Stimson specifically. It was created by executive order by President Roosevelt. And its job was to provide money to support voluntary organizations in their efforts, as well as to create propaganda to maybe scare Nazis into uh, not causing as much harm to uh, refugees and displaced persons as they have been. War Refugee Board, its impact on its help towards refugees, not super noticeable, um, although it did provide money to help their assistance. And then finally, uh, we have the United Nations Relief and Re Rehabilitation Administration, or UNRWA. I should note or point out that when I say United Nations, I do not mean the United Nations as we mean them. It means the un allied United Nations, so the allies in World War II. Uh, the United Nations is something that they would call themselves. UNRWA is basically a boots on the ground organization. And so they are supposed to go into where groups of refugees and displaced persons are, provide them with physical relief and rehabilitation to help support them, and then eventually to assist them with repatriation or being returned to their home countries. UNRWA is probably the most successful out of all these organizations that I have listed. However, it will not become uh, really successful until the end of World War II, uh, or at least close to the end of World War II as um, aggression is starting to wind down. So you may have noticed as I was talking about these organizations that it sounded like they were not super successful. So why did these organizations struggle? Well, there's four big reasons. The first is scope. A lot of these organizations are only able to focus on very specific things, and so they're only supposed to be looking at resettling people in these big schemes. That was something the IGCR was supposed to do. Look at these big schemes of resettlement, but they weren't supposed to be providing actual aid to refugees. Or they're supposed to be helping people on the ground, boots on the ground. That was what UNRWA was supposed to be doing. But they're not able to really come up with these big plans about what to do with large group of refugees. They're just supposed to be dealing with their immediate needs. And so scope was a, a big thing that held a lot of these uh, organizations back. Second thing that held a lot of these organizations back was the governments that controlled them. I think all of us need to remember that many of the countries that belong to the allies were not perfect. They're certainly better than the Nazis, but they have their own issues, especially in regards to uh, different ethnicities. And so many of these nations had laws and barriers baked into them that prevented increased immigration, even during something as catastrophic as World War II. An example of this is the American quota system. Uh, many people in the public also didn't necessarily wish ill on refugees. They just didn't want them in their country. Uh, there were also officials within the immigration system, like Breckenridge Long in the United States, who actively worked against allowing more refugees into the country, even when it was technically okayed by the government in charge. The third thing that is pretty obvious is money. This is really, really expensive. And while there is a war going on, it is hard for governments to justify the cost uh, to these organizations when so much of their budget needs to be going towards their military. And sort of combined with that, we have the war. 
this is a really obvious thing, uh, but it's something that sometimes we forget about uh, when we talk about the allies helping refugees and displaced people during the war is there's a war going on. And so a lot of the allied governments believed that anything that they were going to do to help refugees during the war was going to be a drop in the bucket compared to just ending the war, ending the thing that was forcing them to flee in the first place. Also, a lot of their resources were tied up in the war. And so if you need ships to transport refugees from one place to another, but all of your ships are tied up in transporting troops or goods to the front, you're not really able to help those refugees because everything is tied up in the war. And so those are some of the reasons why these organizations struggled so much. So for the sake of time, we're going to skip towards the end of the war in Europe. So those were the organizations that um, existed during the war and sort of how they operated. So let's talk about the end of the war, at least in Europe, in May of 1945. So the Allies now find themselves in control of Europe, in control of Germany, and historians estimate that around 40 million people were displaced by this war. Now, luckily for the Allies, most of these people that were displaced by the war were able to return to their homes, their home country, as soon as the war was over, as soon as the Nazis had been removed from their country. But they were still left over with around 10 million refugees and displaced persons that they needed to figure out something to do with. So what was done with you? Well, by and large, it depended on who you were. Uh, before the war had ended at something called the Yalta Conference, the United States and Great Britain had signed these things called reciprocal agreements with the USSR. So reciprocal agreements were agreements that said that if uh, one of the armies, so the American army or the USSR's army, as they were moving through Nazi territory, if they collected POWs or imprisoned citizens, uh, from Nazi control, they would take care of them. And then at the end of the war, they would exchange these POWs that they found for their own POWs that had been found by the other nations. So if the United States Army found a bunch of Soviet POWs, they would exchange them for American POWs at the end of the war. However, this meant, unfortunately, for a lot of these Soviet POWs and uh, citizens that were captured by the Nazis, that they were going to be returned whether they liked it or not. A lot of these people did not want to return to Soviet-controlled territory for a lot of reasons. Some just didn't want to return to communist-controlled Russia. Others had been forced into labor gangs by the Nazis, and so they had worked, quote-unquote, although they had basically been impressed into service, for the Nazis, and they knew that they were probably going to be get, get put on trial by the Soviet government as collaborators. And that did unfortunately happen to a, a pretty good amount of these uh, forcibly repatriated uh, Russian citizens. However, by the summer of 1945, the Allies start to change their mind about how these reciprocal agreements work, and they basically stop doing forced repatriations. However, around 2 million people were subject to this forced repatriation. However, you know, we started with 10 million. These 2 million Soviets have been repatriated. So what happens with the other 8 million? Well, the other 8 million DPs and uh, refugees had to go through a process. And so camps and centers were made as the war progressed. So as the Allied armies were pushing forward, they made camps and processing centers behind their lines that UNRWA and the military would run and look after uh, in the hopes that after the war was over, these camps could be used to send these people home. Uh, and so as you can see on this map, there are camps that stretch from the north of Germany over to the edge of Austria and then down even past Rome in Italy. And so they're, they're pretty spread throughout Europe. Following victory in Europe, after victory has been achieved, after they're done fighting the Nazis and they're in control of Europe, the Allies are able to really lean into repatriate, repatriation efforts. And the bulk of it takes place from May of 1945 to September of 1945. In this period, in this couple month period, roughly 6.5 million people are repatriated by the Allies and UNRWA, which is a staggering amount of people to repatriate in that short of a time. It is an incredible feat 
of humanitarian care. Thankfully, it has not had to have been repeated since then, uh, but it is just incredible. However, uh, you know, 8 million uh, people were left over after the reciprocal agreements were seen through and 6.5 million were repatriated. That leaves us with 1.5 million people. So what was going on with those refugees, the refugees that were left over after the summer of 1945? Um, so it's a really good question, but let's look a little bit about what refugee care looked like uh, during and a little bit after the war. So during the war, UNRWA and SHAFE, which is the Supreme Headquarters Allied Expeditionary Force, it basically just means the Allies, the Western Allies in Europe, um, they worked together as they were required to during the war. So they created camps um, as they were collecting people, they'd collect uh, refugees, displaced persons, they'd liberate camps, and then all of a sudden there'd be all these people surrounding the roads and blocking up the military's ability to move forward. So these civilians would be moved to the rear of the Allied lines. They would be put in these camps. The camps were normally made to hold about 1,000 to 3,000 people. They had staffs of around 200 people of the military and UNRWA looking after them. Before the war was over, it was mostly military and less UNRWA. After the war, it was more UNRWA, less military. Uh, but the war sometimes required them to bend these rules a little bit. And so sometimes the camp that was made to hold 3,000 people ended up holding 10,000 people just because that was what they needed to have uh, the situation reflect. Uh, however, as the summer of 1945 starts to progress, there start to become rumblings coming from these camps. The Allies start catching wind of some discontent among refugees and displaced persons. And so um, they decide that they're going to look into it. And I have here the Harrison Report. So let's talk a little bit about the Harrison Report. So Earl G. Harrison was the American representative on the Intergovernmental Committee for Refugees. He is an American lawyer uh, as well. And he's dispatched by President Truman to investigate displaced persons camps in the summer of 1945. So he investigates them from June to August of 1945. He goes throughout displaced persons camps. He interviews uh, DPs and he's trying to figure out what's going on. Do things need to be changed? What's the situation that exists here in Europe? The conditions that he finds in these camps are less than ideal. So first of all, the camp conditions themselves were not fantastic. Uh, some of them had very, very poor levels of hygiene. Some of them um, were not properly prepared to deal with either hot temperatures during the summer or cold temperatures during the winter. You can see in a picture uh, that I have up in the top of this slide, a lot of those buildings that's at one of the, these displaced persons camps are just wooden shacks, uh, which are great during the summer. They're not necessarily anything wrong with them, but during the winter, especially the winter of 1944, which was pretty brutal, uh, they were they were chilly. They were not very closed against the um, against the elements, and so a lot of these DPs uh, did not go through the winter very well. Some of these camps, there was also a problem with their location that Harrison found. A couple of these camps were in the places, or basically just took over where concentration camps used to be. And so that picture that I have at the bottom of the slide is a displaced persons camp in Bergen-Belsen. Urban was a concentration camp run by the Nazis. And so Harrison goes through these displaced persons camps and he finds out that some of these displaced persons and refugees were being held in the camps that had previously existed, basically just to torture them and work them to death. These camps had been converted into caring for them. But imagine if you were a Jewish displaced person who was staying in the exact same camp that had almost killed you over the course of the war, what that would do to your mental state. He also noticed that there wasn't a ton of rehabilitation. He used the term that a lot of these people had been liberated in a military sense, so they were no longer under the Nazi control uh, and they were being fed, but not much more was being done to them. They were just kind of sitting around. They weren't able to do anything. They had nothing to do, nowhere to go. And so they didn't necessarily feel human almost because they just sort of ate and slept and started their day over and over again. They were not being rehabilitated to re-enter the world. Uh, he noticed that Shafe and the Allied armies were not utilizing UNRWA to its fullest extent. 
It was an organization that was made up of people specifically trained to take care of refugees and displaced persons, and they weren't being used to do that. The army was trying to do it by themselves a lot of times uh, and to pretty mixed results. He also noted that a lot of these displaced persons were not getting appropriate rations. In fact, a lot of the Germans who were the defeated party in World War II um, were getting better food than these uh, displaced persons were. And so that was something he said needed to be fixed immediately. Uh, and then finally, the thing that he really noticed, I have another thing here, we'll talk about that, but the, the thing that he really hit home on was optics. So as I mentioned before, some of these displaced persons are still being held in their former concentration camps. Uh, they're also being surrounded by barbed wire and by armed guards. And so the reason that they're surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards is because the allies don't want the Germans to come in and finish uh, off where the Nazis left off. They don't want them to cause further issues for these displaced persons. However, imagine, Harrison says to President Truman in, in his report, imagine how this looks to the Germans. We have them, some of them, in the same camps that they were being held in during the war. Uh, they are not being fed super well, some of them, and they are under armed guard in lock and key. Does this look like we are treating them the exact same way the Nazis treated them? Are the Germans going to look at that and think that we are supporting what the Nazis were doing to these people groups that they had in concentration camps? So he said, we need to fix this based on optics. And finally, he says, you know, should the military even be in charge of taking care of the refugees uh, and displaced persons? He makes sure to say when he says this, that the allied militaries did a really, really good job. Uh, he goes on uh, in his report near the end to say that praise of the highest order is due to all military units with respect to this phase of post-fighting jobs. In directing attention to existing conditions, which require remedy, so all these things he mentioned that need to get fixed, there is no intention to distract people one particle from all of the good things the military did. So he's saying the military has done a great job up until this point, but maybe this job is not best for them. So of course he doesn't just say all the problems that exist in the camps, he offers some solutions as he sees them to fix the conditions in the camps. And so he has five big recommendations that he makes to President Truman. The first is that SHAFE and IGCR guidelines need to become mandatory. So before the war had ended, SHAFE and the IGCR had come up with a guideline book for how camps need to be run and how allied militaries need to take care of refugees. However, this guideline book was just a guideline book. It was not, um, it was not something that needed to be followed. It was not mandatory. It was just a guideline book. And so he says it needs to become mandatory. Uh, secondly, he says that there needs to be better care for displaced persons just in general. Their hygiene needs to be improved, their uh, rations need to improve, all of these different things need to be improved for these uh, DPs. Thirdly, he says Jewish displaced persons need to be given their own facilities. Now that, means, that may seem kind of strange, especially considering he said we don't want to be looking like the Nazis, and it might seem like to us if we're sending these Jewish people into their own camps, doesn't that seem like we're treating them like the Nazis? But no, Harrison meant when he said this that a lot of these uh, Jewish people groups had gone through a very specific sort of torture over the course of the war. What they had experienced in concentration camps and at the hands of the Nazis was not the same as some other people who had been displaced from the war. And so they required very specific rehabilitation and restoration. And so they needed to be in their own camps so that this specific sort of rehabilitation could be carried out for them. Second, or fourthly, the allies needed to prepare for resettlement, not just repatriation. Harrison pointed out that a lot of these refugees weren't just going to want to return to their previous homes. They were going to want to go somewhere else. And then finally, he said that it was probably time for the military to step aside. They had done a great job up until now, but they were not psychiatrists. They were not rehabilitation experts. They were the military. Uh, and so it couldn't really be expected for them to be specialists at this. It was time to let the specialists step in and take a whack at it. So 
as you can imagine, uh, these things that I or that Harrison reported in his famous Harrison report did not go over fantastically um, in the public's eye. Most of that is because of how the media reacted to it. And so they ignored a lot of the nice things that Harrison said about the military and some of his other recommendations. They really, really honed in on what he said about the allies looking like the Nazis and how they were treating the displaced persons and how that might look like to regular Germans. Um, and so the media honed in on that and really was bashing the military uh, over the course of a couple months when this report was first released. Uh, and so Eisenhower, who was in charge of the American military government in Germany and the military in general, as you can probably guess, felt a little bit betrayed. Uh, but because of public pressure and Truman's own insistence that things needed to change, Eisenhower acquiesced and he decided that he was going to make some changes. And so the first change that he made was that shape care guidelines were going to be re reissued. And so this guideline booklet they had made, it was going to be sent back out to all of his subordinate commanders. And now it was going to be uh, have on it the penalty of being relieved of command if a camp commander was found to not be following them. So if someone was not following the guidelines in this booklet, they were going to be removed from command, no questions asked. Secondly, uh, camps were going to be frequently visited by Eisenhower and his staff. And you can see a picture here of Eisenhower leaving um, a synagogue in one of these displaced persons camp. This was so he could make sure personally that these displaced persons camps were being run professionally, uh, well and to the benefit of displaced persons. And finally, Eisenhower issues further directives that are being issued to support and care for refugees and displaced persons. So he's trying to create a job program. He's trying to make it so that they get increased food and increased rations more than your average German citizen. So these are things he's doing to try and help the situation. Eisenhower, to his credit, actually did a very good job with refugees even before the Harrison Port report came out. Um, he had written in 1944 that he thought things were going to be pretty rough for displaced persons and he wanted to make sure they were cared for properly. He just did not have the resources at his disposal to properly care for them. He also told Truman that, listen, I have rabbis and Jewish advisors on my staff. They're supposed to tell me if something is wrong in regards to how we treat Jewish people, but they haven't told me anything, which is probably true. However, it's probably also true that a lot of these uh, rabbis and Jewish people that were on Eisenhower's staff had not been able to visit all of these different camps because there were a lot of them. And so they probably weren't aware of the situation in some of these camps. And finally, he also says, listen, the reason that these people are in uh, their former concentration camps is because they are medically unable to be moved. And so they're only staying there until they're medically able to go somewhere else. And the reason we have these guards and these this barbed wire all around these camps is to protect the displaced persons, but also to cut down on crime because crime is a really big issue um, amongst displaced persons, as well as a black market. Uh, this is something that Eisenhower and a bunch of military commanders really talk about a lot over the course of um, 1946. However, it's not really true. It's been proven by several people that rates of crime amongst displaced persons was not any larger than it was amongst just the regular German population. As far as the black market was concerned, displaced persons did use the black market. However, a lot of military uh, people forgot to mention that it was the Germans that were running the black market. And so it was actually uh, a problem that the Germans were causing, not the displaced persons. And so some of the things he said to defend himself were actually not true, though he may not have known that. Finally, regardless of all of these changes that Eisenhower makes and the offense that he makes of himself to President Truman, refugee and displaced persons care is eventually turned over to UNRWA. And later, after 1947, when UNRWA dissolves, to the International Refugee Organization, which is created to replace it. So, like we said a little bit ago, what about those last 1.5 million uh, refugees and displaced persons that were left after the summer of 1945? Uh, what happens to them? What's going on with them? Well, the number of displaced persons actually grows in 1946 uh, because of sort of the beginnings of the Cold War. So following uh, 1945, 
a lot of the people from Eastern Europe, Jews especially, that decided they were going to return home, they got back and they realized, oh, now my country is under the control of a communist government. And they either were experiencing um, religious persecution because they were Jewish, or they no longer wanted to live in this country because now it was a communist uh, country. And so they left. Uh, and so they went back and then they came back to the camps again. There were also an influx of just regular Eastern Europeans who really, really were worried about living under a communist government. They did not want to do that. And so they fled to the displaced persons camps. And so all of a sudden you have around 2 million displaced persons that are left in these camps. The allies couldn't force them to return because they had made an agreement earlier on in 1946, around January, uh, where they said they were no longer going to force anyone to repatriate. The people had to repatriate of their own free will. And repatriation just means return to your country of origin. So who exactly were those people? That was another question that was asked with these 2 million displaced persons um, after 1946. Uh, these people, a lot of them were stateless. So Jewish Germans in 1941, had their statehood stripped from them if they were outside, or nationality, not statehood, stripped from them if they were outside of the bounds of Germany. This included if they were being sent to a concentration camp. And so they were no longer German, they were stateless. The allies struck this law down when they took over Germany. However, most of these German Jews did not want to take that statehood back up because they said, listen, Germany has made it clear that we're not welcome here. And so if we're not welcome, uh, we're, why would we go back? Uh, why would we want to stay here? And so they refused to take back up this state or this nationality, and they refuse to return to Germany. They want to go somewhere else. This also happens to a lot of the Eastern Europeans who flee the Soviet bloc since they do not want to be part of the Soviet Union. Soviet Union's government says anybody who has fled uh, following the war is going to be assumed to be a collaborator with the Nazis or a Western saboteur, and so they strip their statehood from them. So all of these people technically do not have a home for them to return to. Uh, a lot of the German Jews and Eastern European Jews want to go to Palestine. They really, really want to go to Palestine because they think that that's where they can start again, that's where their lives can start over, and they can begin to make a new life for themselves. However, Britain, who was in control of Palestine, did not allow for any increased Jewish immigration to Palestine or really any at all uh, because they were worried of um, Arab reprisals that might uh, spur off of that. There had been issues in the 1930s between uh, Jews and Arabs that lived in Palestine. And so they're worried if all of a sudden thousands and thousands of new Jewish immigrants show up in Palestine, uh, the population that already lives there is going to have a, a big problem with that. Uh, and finally, they start to realize a lot of these people are not going to want to go back to where they're from. And so we not, need to start thinking of plans involving resettlement, sending them to new places for them to live. So uh, the problem with that, the problem with having all these people that needed to uh, go somewhere, but they didn't necessarily uh, want to go back home was the West wasn't super eager on having them return there anyway. They didn't wish the refugees any ill will. Uh, they wanted them to find a home just so long as that home was somewhere else. Um, the Allies really did struggle with some ethnic issues concerning uh, these refugees. However, slowly they start to put together uh, an immigration policy. However, it is both selfless and selfish. So they like to do what I call kind of unfairly shop amongst the displaced persons. So they'll go after uh, the best looking refugees and displaced persons to bolster their workforce. And so they'll start with the, uh, with the men who are strong and to, can do a lot of manual and menial labor that citizens in their own country might not want. And so they'll make an uh, immigration agreement uh, for these group of people. Then they'll move on to the young men around 18 years old. They don't have any experience with a job, uh, but they can be taught. And at the very least, they're probably pretty strong. So they can do these menial jobs as well. So they'll make an uh, immigration agreement for these people. Now pickings are getting kind of slim. Well, they'll go after uh, single women because they can be taught to be nurses or they can work 
in a sewing factory. Uh, so an immigration agreement will be made for them. Uh, um, and then, oh, I guess we'll go after uh, single mothers with children. Uh, they can probably take care of themselves. So I guess we'll make an agreement for them until finally you're just left with these group of people who are so impacted by the war. You know, they've gone blind because of things the Nazis have done to them. They're very old. They've lost a limb that they just will not be accepted as immigrants by these nations. Xenophobia is also still an issue with these allied nations. They go after specific people groups first. And so they show favoritism to people from the Baltic states. So Estonia, Latvia, uh, places like that. Uh, and then they'll go after uh, Poles and then Russians and then Jews and then other people. And so they really do show favoritism to certain people groups. Sometimes their immigration plans that are meant to help also do hurt. And so they passed this thing, uh, or the United States passes a law in 1948 that is specifically supposed to increase the amount of uh, Jewish refugees that can immigrate to the United States by several thousand. However, there's fine print in this law that says that it shows favoritism towards people that are experienced farmers. Well, a vast majority of the Jews that survived the Holocaust were not experienced farmers. And so while it looked like on paper, this law was helping Jews immigrate to the United States, it actually did not help that much because of this fine print that was in this law. Finally, the displaced persons uh, began to make these communities their own, and they began to truly rehabilitate. Um, they created their own schools, their own schooling system. They had sports teams. You can see at the bottom a picture of a soccer team. They had uh, agreements with universities in Germany where the students from their schools could go to these universities and get a further education. They had job training um, schools so that men and women could receive training in specific jobs that would make them a more attractive immigration candidate. And they, I mean, became their own communities. They had radio shows, they had their own newspapers, they had their own political parties within them. So they began to survive and thrive and go through the process of what Harrison said, uh, becoming human again. They were able to reintegrate back into society. However, a true solution uh, for the displaced persons problem really does elude the West. Um, the only reason that these numbers, these 2 million refugees go down by a significant margin over the course of the 1950s is because Israel becomes a nation. In 1948, Israel becomes a country and its immigration policy is incredibly lax towards uh, Jewish people. And so now all of these Jews who previously could not go anywhere have a place to go and they're able to leave these displaced persons camps en masse. However, by 1952, when the IRO finishes its um, finishes its handling of refugees, it still has around 100,000 displaced persons that is in its care. It creates a fund of $1 million to continue to look after them after it dissolves, and they are placed into the care of the Western German um, government. And so the displaced persons problem doesn't actually end. And that's sort of a very anticlimactic way to end this presentation, uh, but it's true. The Allies and the West didn't find a solution for it. They tried their best, they tried a lot of things. Well, in some cases they tried their best, in other cases they didn't necessarily, um, but they were really not able to completely fix this problem. Uh, and to this day, refugees and displaced persons are still an issue that we struggle with. And so that is the official end of my presentation. Uh, that is all I have for you as far as actual historical presentation goes. I am more than willing to answer any questions that we might have um, on YouTube or uh, chat uh, to answer some of the questions uh, that we might have. Uh, so I see one here. Um, that says, uh, would you say that the United States government felt some guilt turning away so many European refugees, especially Jews, during the war and therefore took a different approach to welcoming refugees post-World War II? There seemed to be a shift in attitudes after the war. Uh, and that's a, that's a really, really great question. And the answer is actually yes and a little bit no, too. So yes, this guilt towards uh, victims of the Holocaust is something that a lot of historians have, um, have noticed and have definitely written down as a trend in history. A lot of these uh, people say that the only reason uh, 
the United States and other Western governments were willing to accept as many refugees as they did was because of the experience that these people suffered over the course of the Holocaust and the fact that they weren't able to help them as much as they probably could have. Um, and actually, if you want to read uh, a very good book about people, uh, Americans learning what these people went through in the Holocaust, I really recommend Hell Before Their Very Eyes uh, by John McManus covers American soldiers liberating concentration camps. Very good book. However, I said yes and also no. And when I say also no, there were still people uh, amongst the United States and other Western uh, countries that their view towards certain ethnicities and certain people groups did not change even in the face of the reality of the Holocaust. And so a lot of these displaced persons in their camps after UNRWA had took control, we're still having issues with American uh, and other nations guards that were watching over the camp uh, because they would be treated poorly because they were Polish. So they'd be called lazy because Polish people are lazy or they'd be subject to searches of their rooms because they were Jewish, because the Jews are probably participating in the black market because that's just how they are. And so a lot of these people, even after all their suffering, are still dealing with xenophobia and ethnic-based um, problems because of um, what they had been experiencing. Um, and so the, the answer is yes and no. Uh, so we have another question here um, that says, was there a widespread understanding of PTSD during this time? I'm curious if part of helping people to rehabilitate included providing trauma therapy. Uh, and so there was an understanding that uh, trauma, especially based off of experiences in wartime, was a thing that existed. This started following uh, World War I, where you have shell shock, and that starts to be something that uh, people are looking into. That does continue into, um, into World War II, and people gain a bigger understanding of it. UNRWA, uh, as I mentioned, is focused on relief, so providing physical aid and rehabilitation. Uh, and so rehabilitation is that sort of providing trauma therapy. It's very, very rudimentary at the time uh, because they're not trauma specialists. It's still a very new idea. And so the way to go about this, however, is a little bit up in the air. Some of people that work for UNRWA um, think that the way that these people need to be really rehabilitated is they need to be put into their family units if they still survive. We need to rehabilitate the family and then they will be able to become working members of society. Uh, and other people think that, well, a lot of these uh, Jewish survivors don't have a family. Their family has been killed. There's a lot of children that don't have a family anymore. And so actually what we need to do is deal more on an individual basis, uh, provide them care, provide them food, provide them um, a community around them of similar people um, so that they can Uh, may have had a little a little interruption there, um, but that that is uh, it, it, they are starting to deal with it, uh, but it's rudimentary and there's disagreements about the best. Way. All right, uh, looks like those are all the questions uh, that we have here. Uh, this is a topic, as I said, that is near and dear to my heart, and so I would love to come back and talk about a specific. Um, part of my presentation, talk about more refugee care or uh, displaced persons care in the war. I would love to talk more about that topic. So I'd love to come back and talk more about it. If you have any questions, concerning uh, may have had another interruption there. If you have any questions concerning some of the things I mentioned, feel free to email the memorial. Uh, but finally, thank you for joining us today. I hope you have a wonder, wonderful rest, rest of your day. Uh, and uh, thank you again for coming and joining us.